Good morning and welcome to our homestead. Today we're going to talk about the top mistakes made when installing a solar power system on your home. When you are going to DIY your own solar, you want to make sure you cover all of these points ahead of time so you don't run into problems in the future. Let's talk about it. Okay, the number one mistake that is made is not understanding how much power you actually need to run your home, especially if you're purchasing a home that's already built and is already on grid and then transitioning that over to solar. You can see our little house in the background over there. It's only about 1800 square feet. It has all modern appliances and all of them except for one is electric. So if you are going to use your power bill or the energy guide stickers on your appliances to try to determine the usage, that is really not a clear picture of what you need to calculate. Your energy bill or electric company bill will help you determine the full spectrum or the big picture of what you need, but it doesn't tell you what you need on a daily basis and it certainly doesn't accommodate for weather, climate, or other things. You really need something like an Emporia View, which is an energy monitor that goes in your electrical panel in your house. We did a video on one, click on it up here if you wanna see that. What this does is monitor the circuits in your house to see how much you're using at certain times of the day. And you can go back and look at the history of how you're using the electricity in your house, and that's very important. Another way to do it is to buy something like this right here, which is called a kilowatt meter. If you're interested in either of those pieces of technology, we have both of them linked below the video. Before we get into all the technical mistakes, I wanna talk about mistake number two, and that is an uninformed or unrealistic expectation of what solar can do for you. Now, I do have to say it is dependent on budget, but solar initially is not gonna work the same way as the grid. It's not gonna be perfect demand all the time, and you do have to monitor it. And just grabbing a little portable solar generator and a few panels is not gonna give you the results that you wanna see. It's not gonna run your whole house, and it's not gonna do it for very long at all. And additionally, on top of that, having a $0 electricity bill almost immediately after you get solar is also quite unrealistic, unless you've sized the solar system so large that it can overcome almost anything. However, if you're still grid tied, you're gonna have a connection fee that you get every single month. So if you're grid tied, you will never see that $0 power bill. And keep in mind, most agreements with power companies now, they do not pay you on a one-to-one -one basis. So if you're generating one kilowatt and selling it back to them, they will not pay you the same amount they charge you for one kilowatt, so be careful. Okay, number three, and not a lot of people think about this, but it is modifying your behavior about how you use the electricity in your home. And what I mean by that is maybe doing a little bit less laundry, changing the temperature in your home, or changing all the light bulbs to something more efficient, or even changing the appliances to something more efficient. But you have to look at the cost benefit analysis on that. Is $2,000 for a more efficient modern refrigerator better than keeping your old one, which uses more, and buying a few more solar panels? You decide. Okay, number four is buying the wrong equipment. Just running out to the store and grabbing whatever solar pieces you can, maybe it's Harbor Freight, maybe it's somewhere else, and just trying to put them all together. And that is not going to work. The system really needs to be designed ahead of time with the proper parts and pieces, and they all need to talk to one another and work together. So if you're finding these small parts and pieces everywhere and grabbing panels, five panels here and 10 panels there and some used panels here, be very careful because they may or may not all work together. Okay, number five, this is going to encompass a lot, but the biggest mistake made by DIYers is not educating yourself ahead of time about electricity. And the following list is really important if you wanna remain safe. You have to know these things. So you need to understand proper wire size and wire size for both AC and DC power. You need to know how to size those for the loads that you have and for the equipment that you have. And on top of that, you need to learn how to size circuit breakers properly and understanding the difference between AC circuit breakers and DC circuit breakers because they are different. There are a lot of charts out there like this one that help you with wire size and with circuit breaker sizing. So dive in and study those really intensely because it does matter a lot. You also need to study sun angles in your area. So basically, if you go by the latitude 
of where you're at, you're going to be optimizing your panel's output. But most racking that you put it on doesn't adjust perfectly for your latitude. So just do the best you can and get it as close as you can. I really don't have to mention this, but if you are in the northern hemisphere, then you need to angle these panels directly south or a little southwest. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, angle them north to northwest. That sun angle is really important if you are going to add panels in front of panels and add racks in front of racks, because you do not want to shade the rack behind the front rack. That is something that's often overlooked. I have six feet between these two racks, and that is the perfect amount for the angle in the winter time when the sun is low for that sun to go right over the top of this one and still hit those panels in the back fully. You need to learn how to calculate the output of your panels. Now, basic math here, watts equals volts times amps. And you need to understand the voltage of your panels and how much voltage your interior equipment, your inverters and charge controllers can handle safely. And something that is often overlooked is the calculation of the panels at their peak temperature. These panels are tested with their voltages at a certain temperature, and that's usually around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. In the winter, that voltage is going to go up. It's counterintuitive, I know. In the summertime, it's going to drop. So if it's too hot out here, your voltage is going to be a little lower. But you want to design your system so that you do not send too much voltage to your interior equipment in the winter time. So I've been talking about mistake number five, but there are some subcategories to this. And one of those I just kind of mentioned, and that is not checking your voltage before connecting your equipment. So what I mean by that is you need to check your voltage of your batteries before connecting them just to be safe. You need to check the voltage of your panels mostly. And that's because if you connect your panels and the voltage is too high for your inverter, you're gonna fry that inverter. And that's a fairly expensive piece of equipment. For this EG4 6000 XP, it has two MPPT charge controllers. Each can take up to 500 volts. So it's very important to understand and learn how to configure your panels, either in series or in series parallel, to get the proper amount of voltage and amperage coming in here, because there are amperage limits as well as the voltage limits. You may have to play around a lot with connecting those panels in different ways and drawing it out on a piece of paper to make sure that is perfectly sized for your inverters. Now, a lot of inverters do have over voltage protection, but you do not want to take that chance. Check the voltage out here on the panels first, do the math first, and then also use a good clamp meter like this one right here to check that voltage on the ends of the wires before connecting everything. You can see behind us our separate system for our barn and chicken coop. This one powers everything over here on the property. Additionally, within this same category, number five, I wanna talk about calculating sun hours properly. That's something that's overlooked. A lot of people don't understand that the amount of hours in the day that you see light is not the amount of sun hours used for calculating solar. There are sun hour charts that are available out there like this one right here that help you to calculate the peak sun hours for your area. And most people in the summertime are seeing 12 to 13, maybe 14 hours of light conditions, but there may only be six to six and a half hours of peak sun hours that are available for the panels to work properly. Those panels may work in a little bit of ambient light and it may initially start up your equipment depending on the type of equipment you have, but you're not gonna get proper charging parameters or proper parameters to actually power any loads in your home. So when calculating and sizing your system, you have to only look at those peak sun hours. That's really gonna help you determine the number of panels you need and the number of batteries you need if you're running an off-grid system. So we talked about wire size a minute ago, and I do wanna mention that you can and probably should oversize your wire a bit. Buying bigger wire helps you if you want to expand your system in the future. So for example, these battery cables on this Victron charge controller are maxed out. Those are the largest battery cables that I could get safely in the terminals in the charge controller. 
And when it comes to the battery cables for everything else, you do want to oversize. As an aside note, I just thought of this too. If you have any bus bars for your connections for your battery cables, you do want to buy the largest ones that you possibly can. That's just going to alleviate any issues with fire or anything like that. And when you are connecting the battery cables to these bus bars, do not overload each stud. What I mean by that is don't put too many cables on one stud because that could cause a bad connection and arcing and you don't want to mess around with that. Keep everything organized and nice on there. I also want to talk about sizing conduit properly. There are many charts out there like this one here and I'll link all these in the description below the video, but they will help you to understand how many wires can go in each size conduit. This is important because your wires will heat up and if they are stuffed in these conduits, then there's more heat buildup and the potential for fire. So really adhere closely to the number of wires per the size of conduit that you have. We're finally on to number six and this kind of goes along with what I was talking about earlier. And that is purchasing equipment before you even know what you want to do with it. Say you see the solar kit on sale and you just rush out and grab it because it's a great deal. That's fine, you got a great deal, but if you don't know how it's gonna be used or what you're gonna be using for it, you're gonna have an issue because you may or may not be able to add to that and it might not be enough power for what your system needs. You'll have to excuse the noise behind me, the inverters are running the house, but we are in our solar room in our house and I wanted to talk about number seven, and that is physical space. Down here in Texas, we don't have basements. So this solar equipment must go inside of your home, or it can go out in a shed if it's air conditioned because it does get quite hot down here in Texas and you, you do not want to go over the operating temperatures of your equipment. So for us, we actually built on a small space on the back of our house. It functions as many different things, but a lot of people don't understand how much space this equipment actually takes up. That's especially true if you have batteries. Now, we are in a crawl space here and the floor is extra strong because these batteries weigh 100 pounds a piece. So next to me with my two battery banks, I have about a thousand pounds sitting on the floor right here. I currently only have two EG4 6000 XPs and our sub panel, but that does take a decent amount of space on the wall because you need to have proper clearance between everything. Now I do have a little bit of room here in the corner to add another inverter and I will be doing that in a future video. I also have my charge verter and we're waiting to test this new charge verter from EG4. But understanding how much actual space you need in your house is very important because you really can't cram this stuff in a corner somewhere. This also holds true for putting panels up. Many people have to put their panels on their roof. I personally don't recommend that. So if you do have some space on the ground, I'd recommend putting them on a ground mount. But if you live in a little bit smaller home and your energy needs are a little bit more, you may be maxing out your entire roof space to put panels on, or you might not even have enough. Mistake number eight is really if you are only off grid, and that is not sizing your storage system properly. The most common storage of course is batteries. These are lithium iron phosphate batteries. You need to understand what's called days of autonomy, and that is if you are in the midst of a storm and you're not getting any sun for numerous days and you're running the loads in your house, understand how long you can go on the batteries without any assistance. That's partially why we have the charge verter up here, and that is so that I can charge these in the instance of a storm that's too long, I can charge these from my generator. That's an extremely helpful backup, especially in the springtime in East Texas, because it's like the monsoon season. We have weeks and weeks and weeks of rain. The ninth mistake that is made is not calculating for your climate properly. Now we kind of touched upon that a little bit earlier in angling the panels and knowing where you live, your latitude, so on and so forth. But it also comes into play where, say you live in a state like Washington state where they do have a lot of rain inland and it is cloudy a lot of the time. It's one of the cloudiest places in the United States. You're gonna need to understand how many more solar panels that you need to overcome those cloudy days. Now at the same time, you need to understand that solar panels lose efficiency over time. There's about a 1% drop in power output per year. So over the course of the life of the panels, which is about 20 to 25 years, you might need to add one or two extra panels in there. 
I kind of touched on this earlier, but the next mistake that is made is not having enough solar panels to do two things at the same time. And that is one, if you're off grid, charge your battery bank at the same time as two, running the loads in your house. So if you only have enough panels to just run the loads in your house, then you're not getting any charge. If solar panels are the least expensive item in a solar system. So adding more is only going to benefit you. These inverters are about to get loud because the sun is about ready to hit the panels this morning. But the last one, the last mistake I wanna talk about is not having the proper tools for the job. So it's really important to get crimpers to crimp your lugs on your wires. Do not use a pair of pliers. They are not made for the job. Get the proper tool made for the job. Now it's really important to have a good pair of wire cutters. It's really important to have nice clean cuts on your wires and that is going to add to the safety. The safety of your system when you are putting it together. You do not want mangled wires, half cut up, and mangled insulation. Just get a good pair of cutters. And at the same time, get a good wire stripper. Now this one is for large cables like the battery cables. This one is gonna last you an incredibly long period of time. It's made in Germany. This will make nice clean cuts on your battery insulation and that is what you want. For your smaller wires, I love this tool right here. This is by Klein. Klein's made in the United States. So that is always a plus. This is gonna strip wire nice and precisely. And then the last one is also for safety and that's insulated tools. So the screwdriver is insulated all the way down to the bottom because you do not want to bridge between a positive and negative connection. You can electrocute yourself. So having these proper tools is important. These are from Harbor Freight, so they are not that expensive at all. And when you are DIYing your own system in the grand scheme of things with all the money you're spending on the components, adding these little bit more expensive tools but proper tools to everything is not going to be that much at all so do it another mistake that is made is with connections and not tightening them down properly loose connections are dangerous and you need to check those periodically over time because there's expansion and contraction within wires that's all i have friends and if you follow those things you're going to be very successful when installing your own solar power system and if you're interested in any of the equipment that we use here on our homestead click on the links below the video we also have links to all of the tools that we use if you have any questions please leave them for me in the comment section below now go check out this video right here which is the installation video on these 6000 xp inverters have a beautiful blessed day see you next time Bye.